So this video is designed to help you understand some of the really important concepts behind the persuasive speech. Specifically, choosing the right type of argument and organizing it in an effective way. Before we get started with this video, I do just want to make a quick note that um, even though you have this video to refer back to as many times as you want, you will learn the information better, more effectively, you will be more prepared, you will leave this class a better speaker if you take notes on this video. And what I mean by that is don't copy the slides word for word. You can go back and watch this video as many times as you want. You don't need to copy the information word for word. What you do need to do, what you should do, is listen, um, pause the video as many times as you need, think about the video, you could even uh, look up the information in your book. Um, you could watch a portion of the video. You could look up that information in the book and read about what the book says and try and put that information together in your mind. And what you should write down, what you should take notes on, is you should write down and take notes on things that help you make sense of the information that is presented in this video. So if we're talking about choosing the right type of argument, one of the first things we need to talk about is, uh, or are, the three different types of persuasive arguments. Now we have persuasive arguments of fact, persuasive arguments of value, and persuasive arguments of policy. All of these different types of claims used in persuasive speeches are discussed on page 361 of your textbook. We can look at the definitions and a couple of examples for each of these. So persuasive claims of fact deal with whether or not something is true or not, or whether something will or will not happen. So example, global climate change is a real phenomenon caused by human beings. Now, you don't necessarily need to agree that this is true, but you do need to recognize that it is a persuasive claim of fact. It is a statement of fact. Your audience is attempting or you are trying to prove to your audience that it is true. It is a, an issue of truth. Another persuasive claim of fact, the Cubs are gonna win the World Series again in the next five years. Now I could go through a speech and I could present a bunch of information to you, um, statistics, money, funding, um, how, how, how good uh, players they're able to recruit, uh, what trades they could make, and I could, I could make a good case that, that, that this could be true. The next one is a persuasive claim of value. And your book just says that something is right or wrong, good or bad, worthy or unworthy. So here's an example. Mr. Malone would make a better president than Brad Pitt. In this example, we've got two things. And um, we're, we're kind of saying one is better than the other. Uh, Mr. Malone as a president is more worthy than Brad Pitt as a president. We could also say, to look at a more realistic topic, that global climate change is a moral crisis. So we're saying that, arguing here, that what we are doing is wrong. Not making changes is bad. It is immoral. And that it deals with um, issues of value. The final type of persuasive claim or persuasive argument is a claim of policy. A specific action should be taken to change something. Or if someone else is arguing for change, you could argue to keep it the same. Now this is important because your persuasive speech must be a persuasive speech of policy. You need to be arguing that something should be changing. Or if somebody is trying to change something, you could argue that we need to stay the same. So here's an example. Mr. Malone should give everyone an A this semester. That's not very realistic. Or the state of Kansas should increase funding for K-12 education, two-year technical schools, and community colleges. Those are all um, examples of uh, an issue of policy where somebody is clearly trying to change something. So for your speech assignment, your persuasive speech assignment, you are coming up with a persuasive speech of policy. So you are trying to persuade your audience that something somewhere needs to change and that someone, a specific group or audience, needs to do the changing. 
So let's pull up an example here. General purpose here is to persuade and our specific purpose is to persuade my audience that Mr. Malone should give us all an A for our work this semester. It's not a realistic example, but it's a good example nonetheless. So if we are looking at a policy speech where X should do Y, where X is a person or a group of people, and Y is the thing that needs to be changed, what is the X, who is the X, and what is the why in this example? Pause this video while you think. So in this example, Mr. Malone is the person doing the change and give everyone an A is the change. So Mr. Malone is the X and the Y is give us all an A for our work this semester. Now we can look at another example. In this purpose, or in this, excuse me, in this example, the general purpose is still to persuade. That doesn't change. They're all going to be to persuade uh, because we're doing a persuasive speech. And our specific purpose is to persuade the speaker's audience that Kansas should uh, ban plastic bags at stores. So who is the X and what is the Y? In this example, the X doing the change changing is Kansas or Kansas legislators. And so that uh, would involve um, the uh, legislators uh, putting out a bill, um, the bill passing the Kansas House, the Kansas Senate, and then that bill going to the governor to uh, be signed into law. So that is the, the group of people we are talking about when we say the state of Kansas. Now, our why, our action, is ban plastic bags at stores. So that's just one more example of a, a policy argument, an argument asking for something specific to change. You might find yourself asking, why? Why is this change needed? And that is a very important question. That sense of need, the need for a change, will be very important for your speech as you think about what information you need in order to persuade your audience and how you will go about organizing that information. But before we can answer that why question, why this change, we need to figure out how to organize the speech. And this is important, so pay attention, because your speech is required to follow this specific pattern of organization. So we have studied lots of patterns of organization this semester. We've looked at topical, we looked at spatial, problem solution, cause and effect, and the good old faithful chronological. For the persuasive speech, we're going to add one more. Monroe's motivated sequence. Now, Monroe's motivated sequence is great for persuading an audience to take action immediately. If you look closely, uh, you'll find that uh, Monroe's motivated is how many um, advertisements for things like arthritis medication, um, or, or infomercials, um, the, the as-seen-on-TV type of products. A lot of these products make their pitch using a Monroe's motivated sequence pattern of organization. So let's think back to our example with the plastic bags to persuade my audience that the state of Kansas should ban plastic bags at stores. We asked ourselves why. Why would anybody want to ban plastic bags at stores? And if I'm going to get state legislators to act on this in Kansas, in a state where people pretty much don't like government intervention in their lives, I'd better have a pretty good reason or a pretty good need. If I can convince my audience that there is a need for a specific action, then I can probably convince them that we need to take that action. Well, as it turns out, plastic bags are a pretty terrible solution to bagging our groceries, and they come along with some pretty terrible side effects. According to Steve Wilson in his article, Plastic Bag Bans Protect the Environment, published in a journal called The Environment in 2014, 
Plastic bags create 11% of garbage on beaches worldwide. Plastic bags are also problematic because they don't biodegrade, which means they don't dissolve back into nature, but they do photodegrade, which means that in sunlight, they break down into smaller and smaller particles that end up in the water. So, um, and this, uh, th this plastic, these small particles of plastic, they can end up poisoning the food chain. Now we are a part of the food chain, so it's not a good idea to poison the food chain. We can continue looking at some um, facts about plastic bags, answering the question, why do we need to ban plastic bags? Um, they have a lasting cost locally. So in LA, plastic bags cost taxpayers 17 cents per bag to remove them from sewers and watersheds. If the bags get into the sewers or into the protected watershed areas, it actually costs taxpayers 17 cents per bag to get the bags out of there, to clean that up. People also don't recycle plastic bags. Fewer than 1% of reusable plastic bags are recycled, and they aren't fully recyclable. Only 30% of the bag can be recycled into a new bag. So, as Steve Wilson says, quote, for every bag you recycle, you create 3.3 more bags. So establishing that sense of a need is an essential part of Monroe's motivated sequence. It's actually so important that establishing that need is one of the three required main points. So for, more, for Monroe's motivated sequence, our main points are need, satisfaction, and visualization. Each one of these main points is like a miniature speech. So we have to make a miniature persuasive argument inside of each point. So the argument of the first main point is that there is a need. You might think of this need as a problem, just a problem that needs to be solved. The second main point, um, the purpose there is to satisfy the need from your first main point. So that just means that you are going to propose a good solution to the problem. The final argument of the speech, the third main point, is to help your audience visualize the benefits. Where the second main point says, hey, this solution is entirely possible. The third main point says, hey, there are some major benefits to you, the audience member. So what you're going to see in the next slides um, is a sample of how you might put together the first main point of the speech. So you're going to actually see a, a real actual outline of the first main point of the speech. So after my introduction, the first thing I need to do, my first main point, is to convince my audience that there is a need or a problem. Now, as a side note, this is this first main point is like a miniature argument. So in this case, my first job is to persuade my audience about a persuasive issue of fact. And my persuasive issue of fact is that plastic bags are a problem. That is my fact-based persuasive claim. So getting back into this, uh, my first main point would look something like this. I've taken the general information that I showed you earlier, and I put it into a real full sentence preparation outline that we'll look at now. And remember, this first main point would take place after my full five-step introduction. The Earth Policy Institute, sponsored by Rutgers University in New Jersey, estimates that worldwide, one trillion bags are used each year. So what does one trillion bags look like? One trillion bags per year is the equivalent of nearly two million bags each minute. Now, Kansas doesn't use all these bags by itself, but to help us understand a huge number like one trillion, imagine every single Kansan using a plastic bag every minute. By the end of the day, every single Kansan would use 1,440 bags, or 525,600 5, plastic bags in a year. 
If we wanted to use all of the one trillion bags used each year, each Kansan would have to would need to use 1.9 million bags every minute of every hour of every day. More realistically, these bags are spread out across the world and they have to go somewhere. Steve Wilson, writing in a 2014 for the journal The Environment, estimates that only 1% of these bags are recycled. The remaining 99% of reusable bags go into landfills, and many are carried by wind, streams, and rivers into our oceans. Once they're in the oceans, they're either broken down by sunlight or spit back up onto the world's beaches. According again to Steve Wilson, thin, thin, thin flimsy plastic, known also by its industry abbreviation HDPE, is one of the most common types of plastic found on the surface of the oceans. Steve Wilson also reported that 11% of the garbage on the world's beaches is made up just of plastic bags. Once we've made our miniature argument that proves to our audience that there is a need or a problem, we then have to satisfy that need or solve that problem. What you need is a specific plan of action that solves the exact problem you've pointed out. In this case, my solution is to ban plastic bags. In my research, I found that the only 100% effective way to solve the problem of plastic bags is to stop producing and using them in the first place. Now, I'm not going to go through every point in this sample speech in detail, but to show this solution works to solve the exact problem I covered in my first main point, I need to go back to my research, find information, and prove this small sub point. The third and final main point in Monroe's motivated sequence is visualization. In the visualization step, the speaker's job is to help the audience visualize the benefits of your solution. How will this solution directly affect or directly benefit your audience? So for this step, you could focus on either positive visualization or negative visualization. With positive visualization, you would present the benefits in such a way as to make your audience feel happy, uh, positive, motivated to accept your solution. With negative visualization, you would help the audience understand what might happen if we don't adopt the solution. Sometimes it's helpful to combine both positive and negative visualization. For more information on visualization, you should look at page 377 of your textbook. Now, before we finish this video, it's important to note that while Monroe's motivated sequence has three main points, it actually has five steps. So the three main points are need, satisfaction, and visualization, which are steps two, three, and four. In our introduction, before we even get to the first main point, we want to make sure we grab our audience's attention with a solid attention step. If we are using the standard five-part introduction, we are already doing an attention step, so this shouldn't feel like a big change for you. After we get to the, trend, to the three main points taken care of and the attention getter in the introduction, in the conclusion, we want to end our speech with a strong call to action. What can the audience do to take action on this itch issue? Simply carry this new understanding into the world? Or do you want your audience to write a congressperson in Topeka? Or do you want them to sign a petition? The idea is that by asking your audience to commit to a specific action, however that is defined, you help to seal their commitment to your policy issue. The last thing I want to leave you with is a way of thinking about your research beyond just where the information may or may not fit in the Monroe's Motivated Sequence Pattern of Organization. This is a strategy that I call the three P's, which I deliberately spell this way because it tends to stick in the minds of students. So whenever you are attempting to persuade someone of something, they usually expect to hear a problem, a plan, and a sense of how that plan is practical. The problem and the plan should both be clear at this point. This is the, the need step and the satisfaction step. But let's touch briefly on the practicality concept. 
So in your speech somewhere, you want to help your audience understand that your speech is, or your solution is practical. So is your solution practical? In my example with the reusable plastic bags, the solution is pretty simple. Just make the bags illegal and they won't show up anymore. That certainly seems practical. It's easy. Somebody signs a bill into law and boom, no more bags. But there is an effect. Saying no more bags would hurt the plastic bag industry, which would have a real impact in workers' lives. And it would eventually have a ripple effect throughout the economy. That's a real issue. And your job as an ethical speaker is to not shy away from that issue. You must address your issue fairly. Look at all of the information and not just some of it. That's all for this video. Hope you have a good day.